Hi everyone, it's Tim Spector here of the Zoe COVID study talking today from uh, a country estate in Oxfordshire, which uh, is not mine, I should say, it's just where we're having a meeting. And I'm going to be talking today about why as access to lateral flow tests and PCRs gets tougher across the nation, how you can use them most efficiently uh, in the future to determine whether you have COVID or not. Also be uh, telling you about uh, our latest diet study, uh, which is giving us amazing insights into all of you out there who skip breakfast and those that don't, and really trying to understand, does that matter? What's the correct way forward? But first, let's get to this week's data. Um, the cases today are at 145,500 new cases each day that you've been reporting, which is a 7% decrease on last week and is on the way down, but that rate of decrease has pretty much halved. So it looks like it's heading towards a plateau uh, and it's not gonna suddenly disappear anytime soon. Not seeing any major changes uh, across the regions or ages as we have in, in, in previous weeks. So it seems fairly consistent across the board. This means that the prevalence, that's the number of people at any point in time who have uh, COVID or Omicron in this case, uh, is down from about one in 24 to now one in 29, but that's still pretty high compared to anywhere, any time uh, over the last two years. And your risk of getting it is still uh, quite high if you haven't had it already. Deaths are coming down uh, on, on over 200 from last week, down to about 681, uh, which is great news. And hospitalizations are also um, uh, continue to decline, although not as fast uh, as we've seen. There's about 1,000 people admit to hospital. Um, 209 people, 290, sorry, on ventilators. Again, that is down from what we were seeing last week. So let's take a quick look at other data sources, particularly the confirmed cases and the ONS uh, survey. And uh, you can see on this first graph that we've been tracking the ONS survey really very well, just about a week ahead of their trends. A little bit of difference in the last uh, few weeks in terms of the rate of decrease. Uh, our rate is slightly lower than theirs, but again, uh, I think that is reflective of the fact we're, we're ahead of them and uh, they will catch up. Um, when you look at the UK uh, dashboard results that the mainstream media, the BBC, etc., tend to quote, they are showing this figure of 27,000 confirmed cases a day, which is really very small and suggests that really COVID is all over. And the, um, we believe that is completely misleading and wrong. And when you look at the government's own data and you take the number of tests done and you look at the number of positives and you compute that together to get the percentage of positives, you can see in this graph here that the um, percentage positive, which is the red line, is really mirroring uh, what we're seeing with uh, the Zoe app and your data very precisely. So we saw that, that double dip uh, that we saw showing that again, uh, most up-to-date data is that um, things have tailed off and plateaued. And this is reassuring that the, the Zoe data you're giving us is actually the accurate one and that the, the stuff that the BBC, etc., uh, trot out about it being uh, four times lower is uh, just nonsense. So um, I think this, this vindicates our approach and the data you're sending us and the importance of the lateral flow tests uh, moving forward as PCRs and everything else uh, gets thrown uh, thrown away. So uh, we don't know what the next stage is for the uh, ONS, but we do know the data you share with us uh, is the best indication of uh, current rates and the most up-to-date one. So I think we've shown that the government confirmed data really isn't uh, worth looking at and the future is, is going to be all but useless. 
another reason for you to keep logging with us and we'll keep giving that information back to you so you know what's going on around you in real time. And we've shown that working together on this amazing digital epidemiology platform, we can create great things, not just for COVID, but also joining us to help fight other diseases. So every reason to keep logging and tell other people uh, to help us out. Now, um, whilst the uh, future of our government funding is uncertain, our own uh, future is not. We are committed to carrying on and delivering data to you. We'll still be here as long as you keep uh, giving us the data. Um, rest assured, we're still absolutely committed to tracking COVID uh, as well as other health conditions. Now, uh, some other really interesting data about lateral flow tests. Soon uh, you'll be paying for lateral flow tests unless you're lucky and manage to get them any other route. So it's important everyone knows how to use them efficiently and uh, safely. And so we've been looking at this data in great detail and got some really interesting insights here. We've uh, shown that people are infectious uh, for less time than Delta than with Omicron. Um, but we haven't really looked at lateral flows as opposed to PCRs. So that's what we've done now. And if you look at this graph, you can see that the, uh, the average time uh, after the first positive test, how many days it took until it went negative, is around eight, eight days, which is perhaps longer than people thought. And um, we didn't find much of a difference between Delta and Omicron, but we haven't yet fully adjusted for all the the differences uh, between them. And um, the vast majority of contributors tested positive on that first day. Uh, they experienced symptoms. So that's really important to realise. No point waiting a couple of days to test yourself. Uh, it, it, do get it on, within that first 24 hours of getting your symptoms, which means you ought to have some lateral flow tests in the house. So now's the time to uh, get them from your chemist or uh, get them online while they're still freely available. Um, now, if you look at when we break this down, and you can see this graph here, um, there was a, a trend in the time taken uh, across different age groups. So that was very much an average. And the older you are, the longer it took for that test to uh, turn negative. And young people, uh, it got through it much quicker as, as you would have expected. Um, and these are, these are unadjusted data, but I think they're gonna hold out uh, in when we, we look uh, in more detail. So you can see in this uh, group um, in the over 70s, uh, 10 days is, is about the average, but you've got a big range going between about eight and up to 12 days, nearly, nearly two weeks. We don't know that means you're really infectious. Uh, no one's done those studies yet, may not be, but it's still uh, useful to know when your, your body is still producing some virus. So age is really important on how quickly your body clears the, uh, the virus itself. Coming back to when to test, um, do test it the first day of symptoms. If negative, do it again the next day. And, uh, Clearly, if you've got a couple of negative tests, uh, you can decide whether you need to carry on testing. But that'd be my recommendation as a, as a sort of minimum. Uh, as I say, uh, do stock up now. And I think we're relying on the lateral flow tests in the future because of the speed of Omicron. Really, PCR testing is pretty useless because by the time you've got the result back, uh, you've infected the rest of your school or house or, or with your work colleagues. So let's talk about symptoms, my favourite topic, and it's nearly 700 days now since uh, I started rabbiting on about this. And now really is the time for the government to just say, OK, all right, let's tell people what the real symptoms are. It has no effect now on people rushing out and depleting their supplies of tests because they're not being given for free. So there's absolutely no reason that the government can't tell institutions schools, hospitals, everywhere, that people should uh, not go there if they've got cold-like symptoms, as well as the, the classic three. 
let's hope that they see sense and do this. In the meantime, these are the top 20 symptoms. Uh, it hasn't changed much in the last few weeks. We're still at runny nose, headache, sore throat, uh, fatigue and sneezing as the uh, top five. Um, interestingly, we did talk about um, loss of smell, getting more and more people complain of altered smell rather than loss of smell. So it, it's often a milder form. So let's turn to your eating habits. People often focus about what to eat, but not when to eat or how to eat. And thanks to your data, we've now done the world's largest study on eating habits. And I can share some of those results uh, with you now, because I think they're really important, because if you go to an NHS website, they will tell you that it's important to eat little and often and never skip breakfast. And I'm going to tell you that that is complete rubbish. And the data really shows us the huge range of uh, timings and, and eatings that are uh, across the country. So if we look at uh, this graph, you can see that uh, some people there uh, are uh, having an eating window of only six to eight hours a day, which means most of the time they're uh, fasting and those individuals are generally uh, skipping breakfast and, and most of them don't eat anything uh, bar before lunchtime. But uh, the average person is uh, so has a, a time window of, of perhaps 10 to 14 uh, hours where they, they are uh, eating in, in the normal way. And if uh, the NHS website is right, we'd see that the people who skip breakfast or have these uh, periods of, of fasting would uh, be doing worse and have uh, higher uh, obesity rates, etc. And it turned out that uh, just under one in 10 of you uh, have nothing to eat before uh, noon and 36% have this eating window of 10 to 12 hours where you are eating and the rest of the time fasting. 39% are eating for a slightly longer uh, period of 12 to 14 hours. So most of you are in that, that, that spot of 10 to 14 hours. And when we look at the data uh, in terms of uh, BMI, as we can see here, uh, there's no clear difference when you take these broad groups and this data isn't yet adjusted uh, as we would for a paper, so it might change slightly, but I think it's reassuring that there's absolutely no evidence that people who don't eat before uh, midday uh, are more likely to overeat the rest of the time uh, through uh, bad habits or feeling super hungry. Uh, and therefore there's no real evidence to back up the old fashioned dogma that we have to be snacking all the time uh, and eat multiple small meals across the day, as many of the outdated uh, information on, on uh, the web tells us. So we're going to be looking at more detail about this to look at optimum times of eating. And this is a great example of how your data is, is helping us. And we're going to start linking this uh, with other diseases. So uh, do continue to give us your dietary data and health data as it arrives and um, update your health uh, inputs into the app which uh, should be live for everybody now so you can, we can get the latest information on you and so we can do many more of these, these fancy analyses together. So to conclude, these are just examples of all the things we can uh, do by working together, so do keep uh, logging and give us information about uh, wider health. Uh, next week I'll be giving you some uh, cutting edge data about cancer and diet, about the importance of your gut microbes in uh, preventing cancer, which is uh, fascinating stuff. And also uh, do remember to get some, order some more lateral flow tests. We've shown you can use them quite efficiently, you don't need very many. And just by giving us some of these results, positive or negative, uh, we can keep this vital information going because we really are the looks like the only early warning device we've got left in this country as we likely to change symptoms, shift to new variants, etc. Uh, certainly there's no evidence that um, uh, COVID has gone away. 
and I'm still uh, perhaps more worried than ever about the long-term effects uh, of long COVID. We'll be bringing you some data on that, but it's absolutely clear is that you still get long COVID with Omicron, and because we have three times as many cases, this is going to have uh, implications down the line. Maybe at a milder level, but still, if people are getting long-term uh, mild illness, that has a major effect on everybody. And I know because uh, it's taken me much longer to recover from uh, my Omicron than I thought because my basic initial symptoms were really uh, pretty mild. So um, we remain uh, a great team working together. Let's keep tracking this and let's save science and keep logging.